Hi, my name is Paula Geisler, and I'm going to tell you a ghost story. This is my experience at a place called Dorsey Mansion. Dorsey Mansion, in 1980, when I arrived in Santa Fe for the second time, was owned by the state of New Mexico with the intention of turning it into a tourist attraction, a national monument or something. I had a friend, uh, a male friend, Greg Baker, who worked for the Laboratory of Anthropology, and he told me that they were going to have to close Dorsey Mansion because the caretakers would just leave in the middle of the night due to poltergeist activity. I thought that was pretty interesting. <laughs> we have a follow up in Santa Fe and was working at a place called Mary Beth's Gourmet Shop. And it was just the toniest place in town right next to the Santa Fe Country Store. And what can I say? It's, I, I'd never heard of prosciutto before I worked there, but Mary Beth and I became good friends. And I worked for her husband, Tom, who had Tom Martin and company, the archival framers in Santa Fe. But that's a digression. The clientele that came into Mary Beth's Gourmet Shop were high-end glitterati. Some of them made movies way back in the 1980s. Curly and photographers. One of the Joyce brothers, he was ancient, was alleged to be in there. I saw George O'Keefe across the street. It was a very exciting time to be there. So. Greg Baker came in one day, the Laboratory of Anthropology guy, and he said, well, you know, blah, 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 we can't keep caretakers because of the poltergeist activity, so my boss, Tom Caperton, and I have to go up there and take all the nice furniture out of the place because, you know, it'll just be wide open, and there's, there's the location. The location is northeastern part of New Mexico. There is a high plateau there that breaks down into these incredible canyons and Dorsey Mansion is on these lava hills out east of Springer on a farm road and then north of Springer 12 miles just straight ahead. It, Dorsey was sort of a carpetbagger, shall we say, after the Civil War who profited from having a star route on the Santa Fe Trail and was a politico and got in with a gang of five in Santa Fe and proceeded to amass a, a pretty vast estate, it appears, from the pictures. Anyway, back to the story. Greg and Tom went up to take the furniture out. Well, I think they had friends at that time, so other people went along as well. And Greg said the strangest things happened to Paula. He said, we were, you know, we're, these guys are scientists, you know, they're, they might have a beer or something like that. They were there to do a job, and they said they were camping outside because they liked that, you know. All of a sudden, they all had this experience simultaneously of this exceedingly cold feeling entering their body through their feet, coming up through their bodies and exiting through the top of their heads. It was so profound that everybody sat up with a start after this happened to them and said, wow! I can't believe what happened to me, and the, you know everybody else said, what well, happened to me too? And so the next day, Greg and Tom are taking furniture out, and Greg says, Tom stops and carries on a conversation with a man on the staircase who isn't there. There's nobody there. And um, when they got down, Greg was just there holding the couch, you know, for a long time, and he said, come on, let's get down. He said, well, Tom, what in the world was going on there? He said, well, I was just talking to that guy who showed up. Well, Greg did not see the guy. So that stuck in my mind. Some of the people who came in, like I said, were filmmakers, and you kind of talk up the customers, you know, while I'm serving lunch. The filmmaker was very interested when I told him about Dorsey Mansion. He wrote down the name and blah, blah, blah. And the next Soon, very soon thereafter, he came in and kind of gloated. Guess where I'm going? To Dorsey Mansion. Well, it's not what you know, but who you know. So I said, well, I'm going too. If you're going, I get to go. So it came to pass that Mary Beth and I, who had become wonderful friends and are still friends to this day, MB, and I got to go on this poltergeist expedition up to Dorsey Mansion. And we drove up there. There were a bunch of us. Tom Caperton, he had a girlfriend then. Maybe Sandra D'Amelio, who passed away, I don't recall. I think Ellen um, Bradbury was there and her significant other. 
there were lots of people, upper level bureaucrats in the uh, the government and arts aspect of New Mexico governance. So we are, and Mary Beth and I. So we get up there, and Tom Caperton, in those days, it was 1980, they did not have um, push button windows, so he rolled down the window and reached out and went beep, 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 pushed this little code, and the gate swung open. Now, I'm telling you, Dorsey Mansion had gone from looking like a little tiny dot, a little tiny dot on the horizon, to this looming, I'll show you a picture, edifice. That, that was kind of creepy. It was poured concrete, you know, I guess when concrete was first discovered and there was a moat around it and all these dead trees and orchards. And, just, and behind it, these windswept black lava hills. In fact, one of the most perfect lava cones in all of, I think, the northern hemisphere is Capulin Peak up there by Dorsey Mansion. It's Folsom Point area up in there. The gate just swung open and we drove around back to where the caretaker's facilities were and it was just standing wide open and obviously the people had left in some uh, um, disarray, but it was okay. We could, it, was, it was well appointed. I mean, it was comfortable. It had everything that you would expect in 1980. I mean, they took their TV. It, I mean, it did not appear to be looted or anything like that. This was soon thereafter. And... We cased that for a little bit. Then we opened some double doors. The, I mean, not double doors, just a regular door from the servants' quarters or the caretakers' quarters into a kitchen that was as big as my house, practically. It was just the most gigantic kitchen I've ever seen with a huge... The cutting block in the middle of the kitchen was as big as my entire kitchen. <laughs> I mean, they probably dressed out buffalo and things like that on there, at least uh, whole cat beeves. And there's going to be a funny thing further on in the story about beeves and beeve thieves. So we walked from the kitchen that went into a formal dining room that was huge, huge and long and open to the east. and. Must have at one time been quite grand, you know, I'm sure you could have seated 30, 40, 50 people there and just vast and nice wood floors and that opened it proceeded further south because the building faced south, had a southerly exposure. They um, had a, what do you call it, a, a, a foyer, I think there's a Hispanic word that's more descriptive, but just, a, you know, where you would welcome your guests, where they would first come in and there was this double staircase that twined down and opened and went up to a balcony and what we would later find out were the bedrooms where Mary Beth and I had to stay. We looked around at that and it was pretty neat and then we went into the old part of Dorsey Mansion. The Dorsey Mansion, when I say it was a log cabin, that, no, it was not a log cabin, it was a log mansion. It was beautiful. I'm, I'll show a picture of it too. You can see it was just built with such precision and repetition of forms and the state had put such money into making it an inviting tourist attraction, but it was not meant to be. The old log cabin part of it was just obviously dry storage at the time we were there, but there had been evidence from 100 years ago and more of different shops and places where people could get medical attention and there was a post office in the basement but there you know store your hides there were hides still stacked there that you know had gotten all crummy and it just had a sense of old oh it smelled old smelled very old and musty and that part was duplicated in the new part, which was cut stone and poured concrete and, and kind of tacky, but grandiose nevertheless, conspicuous consumption. At any rate, we looked around and then Mary Beth and, and I were going to stay in the house. Some of the people had brought campers and were going to be outside, but Mary Beth and I were going to stay. The Curly and Photograph people were going to stay and this filmmaker, they were some Hollywood types, I mean, I was a girl right from Louisiana. I could not believe this woman. In the middle of the day, she had on false eyelashes and fake fingernails and way made up. And 
he was kind of a cool cat and they had an entourage and I think the Curly and photographers were kind of part of their entourage. So they, they were going to stay inside Dorsey Mansion as well because they were going to stay near their equipment and try to get some poltergeist activity, capture it. So we, Mary Beth and I went upstairs to this long hall, bad feng shui, just the longest hall you've ever seen, that at, at the end of this hall were stairs that descended into the servants' quarters, so right there by the kitchen, so they could prepare meals or do what they needed to do, take dirty linen out and down without having to go down through the, the fancy part of the house. These bedrooms were too funny. They were the brightest colors. They were just like Easter eggs. I have never seen such bright colors. One was yellow, one was green, one was blue, one was pink. And they were just stripped bare. I think they had box springs on the floor. And Mary Beth and I picked the pink room. And I remember we put our little sleeping bags and stuff down there and went out and explored the surrounds. Well, the surrounds were creepy, to put it mildly. Dead orchards, you know, because it, nobody was there taking care of it. And these incredible lava hills that really did not support a whole lot of vegetation that would just rise up. You know, like you can almost feel like at one time in recent history, I think in the last thousand years, they oozed out. So we looked at all that, and then it got dark, and it was time to come in. And I think somebody cooked supper. I'm sure it wasn't me. But we had a meal, and then we were going to try to have a seance down in the basement. Down in the basement was a hoot. The basement was as big as the entire two upper stories, and it had a farrier shop and a, a post office with what must have been the heaviest uh, uh, cast iron or whatever kind of metal that is, you know, post office stuff. It just went on and on. I think they had a jail. I'm pretty sure it was a jail. Maybe people just lost it on the Santa Fe Trail or something and had to be locked up. But they had a medical facility down there too. And it's just very interesting places for storage. A coal chute. I mean, it was, it was kind of dark and... Um, I didn't like it down there particularly, so we tried to have a seance and evoke some kind of something, have a table levitate or something, and we all gave it our best, but nothing happened. We, we said the heck with it. Then the, the filmmaker said, well listen, I need some shots of what people would be doing, you know, some cutaways of the gosh, the poor women just off the Santa Fe Trail, they want a bath too. Who will be a model? Well, I did not mind. It was just a silhouette, a shadow. It was not my real person. So I pretended I was taking a bath, you know, washing my hair. And it was just from the waist up, what can I say? And he got some shots of that. And then it was time to go to sleep, so everybody just turned into a pumpkin. The next morning, woke up, looked around some more. Then we decided, we decided, well, it's beautiful now. It was the roundup time in northeastern New Mexico. That's cattle country. I mean to tell you, it is cattle country. And they were having roundup, so those back roads, we thought we'd take these back roads and look at Capulin and end up in Raton and have a nice steak dinner. I didn't look to see if it was the state credit card. However, we drove on these roads and we got to, uh, it was like a Lamy's restaurant and they specialized in beef. Somewhat um, unsettling because you had to have reservations, which we had made, but also once you got there you had to wait and there was a really nice, well-appointed, you know, leather and so forth um, waiting room. And there was an art show, and at that time I was into art shows, I'm still into art shows, oops, but at that time I was as well, and Mary Beth was as well. And this was a beautifully installed show, I mean they had gold leaf frames and they were just formatted beautifully, but I couldn't quite tell what they were. Well I got up and looked at them, they were all pictures of people who were legally hanged for st stealing cattle, legally hanged for stealing cattle cattle thieves, punishable by death. And there they were, just, they were black and white, pretty well, good resolution, but they were, they were obviously dead, and they were old, and they were framed, and you looked at those while you were waiting for your table. So we had a great meal, and talked about things, and on the way back, oh, I forgot to mention, while um, the, in the morning when we woke up, the filmmaker and the Curlian 
people were very disgruntled. None of their equipment had functioned. It had malfunctioned, and they hadn't had a ghostly experience. So they were off to some other story. So they just left, and that left um, six of us, I believe. Mary Beth and me, and Tom, and his girlfriend, and Ellen, and her boyfriend. We didn't care. I mean, we had a good time, and we, on the way back, <laughs> as we turned to head up to Dorsey Mansion from a different direction, all those farm-to-market roads crisscrossed that part of the state, and but it still it started looming bigger and bigger as we were getting there. And I remember we both looked at each other, exchanged a glance, because we had the same thought. We're going to be the only two people in the house tonight. But nothing had happened the night before. We didn't think anything of it. You know, it was a lark, but so what? Sure enough, we got to the to the mansion proper, and the people who are staying outside go to their campers, and Mary Beth and I go upstairs. There wasn't any electricity. We used flashlights, and I remember reading with the flashlight some Time magazine or one of the weeklies. I can almost remember what was on that page. I wish it would come back to me. And then I got sleepy. Mary Beth had obviously uh, already dropped off, purring, uh, snoring. So I knew she was asleep. So I thought, well, I can go to sleep now too. Nothing happened. So flip, flipped off the flashlight, got comfortable. It was dark. It was really dark. It was really dark. Within, I'd say, two to three seconds, right on the door, loud, bam, 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 on the door of our room, which we had shut and locked. I was certain that the people downstairs were playing a joke on us and had come upstairs and knocked on the door to scare us. But I was a little bit apprehensive. Then this noise not only continued, but it appeared to run up and down these, this hall with these garish bedrooms all off one, one side of it. And it would run down the steps to the, to the kitchen and then it'd come up the steps and it'd run back and then it'd wait in front of the door and you'd bam, 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 bam. That was pretty bad. I was starting to get a little bit apprehensive. Of it. Mm, it's gone on a long time. Uh, it's not funny. Then the noise started coming from the windows. The windows were old, those old glass that were curvy. They felt like they were going to break the noise. This is what they were just hitting, shaking the glass in the windows. Well, I was getting really scared. The floor started moving. The floor started moving. It did. The roof was moving. It was loud. It was really terrifying. I was scared almost to death. And I did what I have done on the two or three other times when I have been nearly scared to death. I evoked the deity. I became as a little child. I said I was sorry that I had shoplifted those chocolate covered cherries in the seventh grade and to please tell my mother I loved her. And I was so afraid. And the next thing I knew I was in the kitchen of Dorsey Mansion. I was just standing there, leaning against uh, the wall, looking toward the cutting board, and a man was leaning against that cutting board. He was not an ordinary man. He had his arms folded. He had on blue jeans. They were pretty dirty, but he didn't personally look that dirty, but his clothes were kind of dirty. And he had a really threadbare look like Southern a jacket on. He, he didn't have a hat on. He was clean shaven. He was actually kind of cute. <laughs> he was clean shaven but he, and had blue eyes, but his hair was so black that even though he had shaved, you could see where his beard wa would, have, would have been. And his ha black hair was really, really curly. Those blue eyes. He had this one feature. This one feature that made me know he was not from this world. This sounds gross, and it was. All I can say is it was, and it was just like a fathom I had appeared. I was just numbstruck. I, anyway, I was staring at him pretty intensely. He had, he had, 
he had made a mustache out of his nose hairs. Even Salvador Dali didn't come up with anything that cool. It was just unbelievable. It came out and it just spiraled around and like hook of horns, you know. It was just very um, peculiar, obviously an affectation from wherever he came from. And then he spoke. And he said, I guess you're concerned about what's going on here. Well, that was the understatement of, of any understatement in my whole life. I had never had an experience like that. I never have since then. I was just flabbergasted. I did not know what to say or do. But he was very amiable and cordial, and he said, we're always around. It was something of the idea of parallel universes, but you know, we're always here. But we only manifest in your realm when people like you are near death, are scared to death. And he said, that is sort of an energy that's trapped between worlds by somebody who died a horrible death here. And the only power it has over you is to scare you to death. And it was doing that, so here I am. And everything's going to be okay now. And he, he drew on the dust on the cutting board. We, nobody had been very um, kitchen-esque. And there was uh, dust on the d cutting board. He drew on that cutting board. He said, Napola, I know that down here you were born in February of, oh, way back when, I don't want to say it. Then he drew a straight line up. And he said, and then your life is going to end. Um, I said, oh, you know, I don't need to know exactly when. If I know when, I might, my life might be different. I'll just let the mystery be. But I know, I know it's going to end and it's up there. And he said, but you need, you need to be aware of the fact that parallel to your life that has a beginning and an end is an existence that does not have a beginning and an end. And he drew a circle to the left of the one, like zeros and ones. And I didn't think that at the time, but later. And he said, to partake of this existence that doesn't have a beginning or an end, and that when he said this, it was almost like it was in Dayglow letters. He said, you need to concentrate on spiritual matters. Plain and simple. You need to concentrate on spiritual matters. I have been pondering exactly what he meant by that admonition. Is that, would that be the right word? That um, instruction. That instruction. These many, many, many years since since I had that experience. And my conclusion is that spiritual matter is people. People do have a capacity for spiritual stuff. So that's what I think he meant. He, he, he made mention again of the en entity that it was just sort of trapped between worlds and probably it was a, a traumatic experience that happened there. Well, golly, it was on the Santa Fe Trail. Who knows what kind of horrific things people had encountered, you know, crossing a... Apacheria or the Comanche country or, you know, from St. Louis pretty much to Dorsey Mansion. It was wide open. It was pretty scary. And I'm sure bad things happened. So then I was back upstairs. I was just back upstairs. I don't remember floating on any astral cord or anything like that. I was just back upstairs. I was in my bed. Had my eyes just closed, shut, shut, shut. I was still very... Uh, amazed at what had happened. Those noises continued all night long, all night long. And the second it got light, because it, it was so bright up there on those high plains of northern New Mexico, that when the sun would come up, it would just flood the room. And even through your eyelids, you could tell that it was daylight. And as soon as that happened, the noise stopped instantly. And in the next instant, Mary Beth's eyes popped open and I was staring at her. And I said, did you hear what I heard? She said, yeah, I did. You know, I mean, she was flipping out about it. And uh, I was too. And I said, well, did you go downstairs and, and see the ghost? And she didn't know what I was talking about. And she, I could tell she had not had that experience. So I said, well, I have proof. He drew on the cutting board. Let's get down there. I can't wait to show you. So we ran down that hall and down those steps, 
came into the kitchen. Just as we walk in, Tom Caperton's wiping down the cutting board. How do you like your eggs? Over easy, sunny side up? There was no way to prove it. There's no way you should try to prove stuff like that. But it was, it was just a funny um, twist there at the end. This man left me with an odd legacy that in fact, I, I was affected by it for many years. I have to confess that my skills have diminished with age, but for years after that experience, and much more intensely at first, I was able to remember sequences of numbers forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards. I could make money, I could take bets, <laughs> and uh, do this, and I, I could remember people's names. Even back then in the 80s, gosh, the art crowd in Santa Fe, it was, it was a trip. And you know, you'd go to a party and there'd be 200 people there. And as soon as you heard their name, you'd forget it. I was, I was not alone. I was not alone. Everybody uh, had that experience. But all of a sudden, I could remember people's names. I could remember everybody's name at parties. And people would take bets there that I couldn't remember. And sure enough, I could say, well, that's Joe and Henry and Mary and Elizabeth and all of them. I should have become a politician. <laughs> but at any rate, those were definitely qualities that I did not possess prior to that experience. And I have to say, have diminished greatly since that time. So, why am I telling you this story? It's the most peculiar thing that's ever happened to me. It was life-changing, and I have given it a great deal of thought over these many years since 1980, and this is what I believe. I believe that the love embrace of the universe is always available for us if we become like a little child and cry out in fear. That is exactly what happened to me. I was terrified. I prayed. My prayers were answered. I had had that experience another time. And after that, when I thought a bear might eat me, but that's another story. This, I think, is the lesson to be learned from Dorsey Mansion and my ghostly experience is that there is a net there and if we express that fear and cry out for, for help, help will be there.